Hello everybody, we are going to look at shorter and cost curves for a firm. But to do that, we need to understand this law, the law of diminishing marginal returns. That can help us explain why shorter and cost curves are shaped as they are. Now, we're looking at the short run. And in economics, when we look at short run and long run for a firm, we're not looking at time periods. We're looking at the nature of our factors of production. And in the short run, we say that at least one factor of production is fixed. At least one is fixed. In truth, normally two are fixed, land and capital. We tend to run with that assumption. Okay, but certainly at least one there is at least one fixed factor of production. In the long run, all factors of production are variable. Okay? And that kind of makes sense. In the short run, firms are restricted, uh, whether it's by resources or, or by, financial, uh, by financial money. Therefore, they can't expand production by buying new factories or by buying new machinery. It's too expensive to do so in the short run. Whereas in the long run, as the firm gets bigger and bigger and bigger, they can expand much easier by varying all factors of production. So there's at least one fixed factor of production in the short run, usually land and capital. And we assume in the short run that the variable factor, there is one variable factor, which is labour. So firms in the short run can vary their labour. They can hire more workers in the short run. Okay, so that's the difference between long run and short run. Nothing to do with time period. Now, what we need to explain, we need to isolate labour. Because a lot of the short run cost curves can be explained via the productivity of labour. And especially about diminishing returns to productivity. And to do that, I want to use this numerical example. It's something I did with my students in class. Uh, we had, well, we had a, a model firm who... Uh, specialised in making paper aeroplanes. And what we had was one table and three chairs around the table. That's all we had. We had our, our fixed capital, our table and three chairs, and we had fixed land, which was just the space around the table. And what we did, we varied our variable factor, which was labour, and we kept adding workers to try and increase the number of paper aeroplanes um, that were made for the firm. And these were the figures that we got. Okay, so we have labour on the left here, starting with zero units of labour to six units of labour, six workers eventually. Um, and then we can look at how many paper aeroplanes were produced as we went from round to round, as we hired more and more workers. So initially, going from naught workers hired to one worker hired, that one worker managed to make four units, four paper aeroplanes made in a given time, which was, I think, one minute we had. The next uh, worker, when we had two workers hired, so two chairs were filled, our total product, the total number of aeroplanes made, went up to nine. Okay, so nine planes made in the same one minute time frame by our two workers. When we had three workers, the total number of planes rose to 15. From four workers rose to 17, five to 18, and six to 15. Okay, so this was the total product, the total number of aeroplanes made with these number of workers each round. Okay? Now with those figures, we can break them down into different concepts, something called marginal product and then also average product. Now when you hear the term marginal in economics, all we're looking at is the extra benefit, the extra cost. The key term there is extra. Marginal is simply the extra. Okay? In this case, the extra product, the extra units made by each additional worker. So let's have a look. When we hired our first worker, how much extra did that worker bring in from the previous round, from the previous number? Well, previously, nothing was brought in, there were no workers. That one extra worker brought in four, so the marginal product was four. The second worker, how much extra did that second worker bring, okay, compared to the first round? Well, in the first round, we only made four. In the second round, we made nine, so the extra output produced as a result of hiring the second worker was five. Okay? How much extra did the third worker bring? Or six. Okay? Brought in six from nine to fifteen, he brought in six extra. Okay? The fourth worker brought an extra two, fifth an extra one, sixth actually reduced to minus three. And the average product is very simple to work out. It's just the total divided by the number of workers. How much on average did each worker bring? Okay, on average four divided by one, the first worker brought in four. On average, Four workers okay, bring in each 4.25 units. Okay, you divide 17 by 4. That's how you work out the average product. Okay. Product here very simply means the average output.
Okay. Very simply using these figures, let's plot curves. Okay, and we can explain the shapes of these curves in a second. All right. Now, I've already plotted some points. So the green points okay, represent the average product, and the red points represent the marginal product. Okay, these crosses here are very simply linked to these points. So have a look at the figures that correspond to the points on the graph. Let's simply plot the points and see what we get. Okay. So the green tells us the average product, so I'm going to call that AP there. Okay. And the red points tell us the marginal product. In truth, we're starting at the same point. So let's connect these, roughly connect those. Doesn't have to be perfect. Okay, and we do go negative. Okay. And the key thing to take away from this is not the one way drawing the curves, it's the, the shape of the curves. That's the most important thing to take away. We can actually understand why these figures are the way they are and why the curves are shaped the way they are because of this law of diminishing returns. Now remember, in the short run, we assume there to be at least one fixed factor of production. In my example, land and capital were fixed. Labour was variable. Now, the law of diminishing returns states that in the short run, okay, when we add variable factors of production, assumed to be labour, so when we add variable factors of production to a stock of fixed factors of production, Total product will initially rise and then start to fall. That's the definition of diminishing returns. Okay? So when we try and add variable factors to a stock of fixed factors of production, total product will start to rise and then eventually start to fall. That's exactly what we see here. We need to understand why that's the case. So total product is rising, 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 all the way up to 18, and then it starts to fall, exactly the definition of diminishing returns. Now, why is that? Very simply, it happens because of the constraints of our fixed factors of production. All right? So, initially what happened was, we had three chairs and one table. Okay? So, when we hired one worker, there were still two chairs left. There were still underutilized fixed factors of production. We had two chairs not being used. We had table space not being used. We had underutilized capital and underutilized land. So then when we hired the second worker, we could fill up some of that extra space. Okay, we could use a second chair and we could have more space used around the table. So in that sense, we were utilising our fixed factors a bit more. Even the third worker, we then used our third chair and we used up all the space around the table. But then, when we hired our fourth worker, suddenly there were no chairs left for that fourth worker. There was no space for the, for, for the fourth worker. Therefore, that fourth worker found it difficult to work. And even though that fourth worker we could assume had the same skills as the previous worker, he couldn't be as efficient because of the constraints. There weren't enough chairs for him to sit at. There wasn't enough table space for him. Similarly, for the fifth worker, even more of a problem. Okay, even more problem with space and constraints. And for the sixth worker, it became so much of an issue, the space, the, the space constraints, that actually it made him less efficient. Even, even less efficient, so much so that he was actually bringing less to the firm in terms of the amount he was producing. Okay, so we can look understand these figures by um, talking about the utilization of our factors of production. Okay, so initially we had underutilization of land and capital. We had spare space around the table and spare chairs. Up until we maximized um, the productivity of these factors of production which was at the third worker, we maximised the utilisation of our land, we maximised the utilisation of our capital when we hired our third worker. Thereafter, okay, we were over-utilising them. But at the same time, we can also explain these figures by looking at the productivity of labour. As we hired the first worker, and the second, and the third, the workers, from round to round, got better and better at making paper aeroplanes. So that first worker, in the third round, understood what he was doing a lot better. Like, became very, very good at what he was doing, and also maybe he could devise labour. He could tell the new workers hired how to probably produce these paper airplanes to the most efficient level. Okay, what are the best techniques to use? Okay, what ways can we actually devise our labour up? Maybe some workers could focus on doing the folding, maybe some workers could focus on uh, testing the planes, okay, etc. etc. So labour could be devised, and at the same time, labour was specialising, which meant that at the start there were initial gains. Okay, initial gains. But again, the fixed factors, the fixed constraints then took over towards the end. 
and we're sort of diminishing returns. And that can be explained further by looking at a marginal product. So what happened when each extra worker was hired? Well, initially we had marginal gains. Each worker was bringing in more than the last worker. Okay, four, and then suddenly to five, one extra, six, one extra. And that's again when we saw specialization gains, and when we saw gains from underutilization of land and capital. All right, therefore, as we were utilizing these resources better, more efficiently, our marginal gains increased at the same time. Labor was specializing, so we saw marginal gains until we maximized uh, the utilization of fixed factors and then constraints set in. Workers were getting each other's way, hands were getting each other's way, okay? people couldn't get to the paper, okay? people were shuffling and shoulder barging each other trying to actually make stuff. People were getting each other's way, so then we saw diminishing returns. So when we went from six, okay, marginal gain there, one from the last person, we then saw a marginal loss, okay, a diminishing return, okay, from six to two, then from two to one, and then from one to minus three, the actual returns, the marginal returns became negative. That sixth worker okay, actually reduced output by three. Okay, so we can see diminishing returns after the initial marginal gains. And similarly for average product, we see a similar trend. And that's exactly what we see on the graph. Okay, so if you look at both graphs, both curves that we've drawn here, we can see that initially we have these marginal gains. Okay, so look at the red line. Marginal product goes up. Each additional worker is bringing in more and more units of output because of underutilization of fixed factors and because of specialization of labor. Up until the point, okay, up until the point where we go beyond our third worker, suddenly now we're constrained by our fixed factors. Okay, suddenly everyone's getting in the way, so therefore the productivity of labor starts to fall. Even though the skills are exactly the same for each worker, because of these fixed constraints, the workers can't be as efficient as they would otherwise be. All right? Workers get, it, get, it, get in each other's way, we start to see diminishing returns, to a point where actually the returns start to become negative for the sixth worker hired. All right? And that's why the shapes are shaped like this. So we're looking here, at the productivity of labor, the marginal product of labor, the average product of labor, very much looking at how much work this can actually bring in, okay, and how that's determined by the law of diminishing returns. All right, so that law, the law of diminishing returns, states that in the short run, which is the key thing, in the short run, when variable factors of production are, are added to a stock of fixed factors of production, total product will initially rise and then will start to fall. That's the key thing to take away from this. When we understand this rule, we can apply it to lots of different short-run cost curves as well. Okay, thank you.